Hello! In this video, we're going to consider the extreme values of functions. Let's begin with the definition of a maximum of a function. Let's let f be a function defined on a set d, which is usually an interval. We say that f has a maximum value at a point c in the set d if f of x is less than or equal to f of c for all x in d. If we consider an example, Suppose we have a graph that looks like this. And suppose my set D is the closed interval from A to B. And suppose here's my y-axis. The value C is where this maximum value occurs, and we see that F evaluated at c is greater than or equal to f of x for all other x in the domain. And we say that f of c is the maximum value of the function and the maximum value occurs at some point c in the domain. The definition of a minimum of a function is similar. Given a function f defined on set d, f has a minimum value at a point d in this set D if f of D is less than or equal to f of x for all x in D. And again, f of D is the minimum value of the function, and the minimum value occurs at some point in the domain. And again, I can say if I've got that similar graph, suppose it looks like this, we can say that the lowest possible function, the lowest, po I'm sorry, the lowest possible output value occurs at B in this case. So I'm going to say that B is the D that we're talking about, and the minimum is the function F evaluated at D. F of C and F of D are called the extreme values for F. Let's consider two questions. When are we assured that a function has a minimum or a maximum? And where do the minimum and maximum values occur? Or at what points of the domain do those minimum values and maximum values occur? Let's consider the first question. When we are assured that a function has a minimum or a maximum? Well, we have a theorem for that. It's called the extreme value theorem. It's also known as the max-min theorem. It says, let f of x be a continuous function on a closed interval from a to b then there is a maximum value and a minimum value for f on that closed interval from a to b. Now notice we have two hypotheses in order to be guaranteed that we have a maximum value and a minimum value. In fact, the function must be continuous and we must be on a closed interval. Now that's not to say that we can have functions that are not continuous or not on a closed interval and they still have maximum values or minimum values but we can be assured or guaranteed that we will have a maximum and minimum if these two hypotheses are met. So this is also saying that there are points C and D in the closed interval from A to B where f of D is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to f of c for all x in the closed interval from A to B. So f of D is the minimum value of our function f, and f of c is our maximum value of our function f. Okay. If the function fails to be continuous or the interval is not closed, then we are not guaranteed that the function f has a maximum or a minimum value. I'd like you to pause the video and consider giving an example of a continuous function on an open interval that does not attain a maximum or a minimum. Secondly, I want you to give an example of a function that is not continuous on a closed interval and it does not attain its maximum or its minimum. So we're not going to address that in this video, but that's something that you should be able to, to address. Let's consider the second question. Where do minimum and maximum values occur? At what points of the domain? Where should we be looking? Okay. Well, first let's consider the definition. When a point C is inside the domain of F, so it's inside the interval, it's not an endpoint, and F prime of C equals zero, or F prime of C does not exist, 
we call C a critical point of F. So again, I'm saying that the endpoints of the inter intervals are not critical points when we're considering this definition. It needs to be inside the domain. Again, we have a theorem. This theorem says that if f of x is a function defined on an interval i, which and f has a maximum or a minimum value at x equals c, where c is inside the interval, then either f prime of c equals 0 or f prime of c does not exist. Or in other words, c is a critical point of f. Let's consider an example. Let's consider a function where it ha which has a maximum. This particular theorem is saying that if I'm given my interval, in this case from a to b, our maximum occurs at a point c, in this case where the derivative does not exist. So notice this is saying if we know that the function does have a maximum or minimum, then either one of these cases must hold true. Either the derivative is equal to 0 at that point or the derivative does not exist at that point. Where should we look if we're looking for a maximum or minimum value of a function? Here's the statement. A maximum or minimum value of a function f can occur at x equals c in an interval i where c is an endpoint of an interval, f prime of c is equal to 0, or f prime of c does not exist. And notice these two cases f prime of c equals 0 or f prime of c does not exist implies that c is a critical point. Now, and again, we're not guaranteed that if we look at all these places, we will have a maximum or we will have a minimum there. But it's just saying these are the candidates where we should, where we should look for a maximum or a minimum. So how do we go about finding the maximum or minimum values of a function? We first identify the candidates for the local, we first identify the candidates for the location of a maximum or a minimum value of a function. Specifically, we look for the critical points where f prime equals 0 or f prime does not exist. Or we look at the endpoints. Then we evaluate the function at each of those candidates and we select the extreme values. Let's look at this example. Let's let f of x equal 1 minus x times x plus 2 quantity cubed plus 6. Let's find the extreme values of the function f on the closed interval from negative 3 to 2. Now we know that in this particular case f is continuous, it's a polynomial, and negative 3 to 2, the interval from negative 3 to 2 is a closed interval. So by the extreme value theorem, f has both a minimum and a maximum value. And in fact, we can look at the graph and we can see pretty much where, where the maximum occurs and where the minimum occur on this particular interval. But so let's look at it um, in light of, uh, of the statements we've been considering here. Let's first identify the candidates for the locations of the max and min. Let's look at the critical points and the endpoints. In either case, with the critical points, we need to identify, first of all, the derivative. So let's take the derivative of this function, and we need to find, we need to apply the chain rule, which means we're going to bring the power down in front, subtract 1 from our power, and then multiply by the derivative of what's inside. So this is by the chain rule. Next, we notice that right in here, we have a product. So we're going to apply the product rule. Applying the product rule and then simplifying, we get 3 times 1 minus x quantity squared times x plus 2 quantity squared times negative 2x minus 1. So we can set this equal to 0 because we don't really need to consider where the derivative does not exist because this derivative exists everywhere on the real number line. So we only need to consider where this derivative equals 0. And we can see when we set each factor equal to 0, the critical points are x equals 1, x equals negative 2, and x equals negative 1 half. So these are my critical points for the function f of x. 
once we evaluate the derivative and set it equal to zero, we see that those the locations of the, of the critical points make sense because we see that when we look at the graph of the function, we see that there's a horizontal tangent line at negative 2, at negative 1, and also at 1. Okay, so those are our critical points. And it is clear from this diagram that um, even though the derivative equals 0 at, for instance, negative 2 and at positive 1, we don't see a maximum or a minimum in either of those values. But again, this statement was just saying this is where you should be looking. Okay. Next step in the process is to evaluate the function at the candidates we just identified and then select the maximum and minimum values of the function. So we're going to go ahead and say, well, we're going to evaluate the function f, and I'm just going to go ahead and make a table of values at our endpoints, negative 3 and positive 2. Also at our critical points at negative 2, negative 1 half, and a positive 1. And when I evaluate the functions at, this, at these points, f of negative 3 is going to be 1 minus a negative 3 times negative 3 plus 2. That product gets cubed, and we add 6. And when we evaluate that, we get a negative 58. When I evaluate the function at negative 2, I actually get 1 minus a negative 2, negative 2 plus 2, which we see is 0. So when I cube that, that's still going to be 0, and I add 6. The function evaluated at negative 2 is equal to 6. The function evaluated at negative 1 half is going to be 1 minus a negative 1 half times negative 1 half plus 2. I'm going to cube that product and add 6. And when I do that, I get 3 halves to the 6th power plus 6, which is approximately 17.39. The function evaluated at 1, we end up getting a 0 when, before cubing, and then I add 6. So again, the function is going to be evaluated to be 6, and f of 2 is also a negative 58. Okay. So when I look at these output values for these um, the critical points and the endpoints, I see that I have two locations for that minimum value. So the minimum value of the function is a negative 58, and the maximum value is approximately 17.39. So again, when you want to identify the maximum and minimum values of a function, you look for the critical points and the endpoints. You evaluate the function at each of those candidates, each of those points, and then select your, uh, select your maximum and minimum values of the function.